Arby. Arby awoke, sitting upright in bed, blinking his eyes in the morning light that streamed in through the trailer windows. In the next bunk, Kelly was still asleep, snoring loudly. He looked out the window at the entrance to the big building and saw that the adults were gone. The explorer was standing by the entrance, but there was no one inside the car. Their trailer sat isolated in the clearing of tall grass. Arby felt entirely alone, frighteningly alone, and a sudden sense of panic made his heart pound. He never should have come here, he thought. The whole idea was stupid. And worst of all, it had been his plan, the way they had huddled together in the trailer and then had gone back to Thorne's office, and Kelly had talked to Thorne so that Arby could steal the key. The way he had set up a delayed radio message to be transmitted to Thorne so that Thorne would think they were still in Woodside. Arby had felt very clever at the time, but now he regretted it all. He decided that he had to call Thorne immediately. He had to turn himself in. He was filled with an overwhelming desire to confess. He needed to hear somebody's voice. That was the truth. He walked from the back of the trailer, where Kelly was sleeping, to the front and turned on the ignition key in the dashboard. He picked up the radio handset and said, This is Arby. Is anybody there? Over. This is Arby. But nobody answered. After a moment, he looked at the dashboard systems monitor, which registered all the systems that were operative. He didn't see anything about communications. It occurred to him that the communications system was probably hooked into the computer. He decided to turn the computer on. So he went back to the middle of the trailer, unstrapped the keyboard, plugged it in, and turned the computer on. There was a menu screen that said Thorn Field Systems and underneath that a listing of subsystems inside the trailer. One of them was radio communications, so he clicked on that and turned it on. The computer screen showed a scrambled hash of static. At the bottom was a command line that read, Multiple frequency inputs received. Do you want to auto-tune? Arby didn't know what that meant, but he was fearless around computers. Auto-tune sounded interesting. Without hesitation, he typed, Yes. The static scramble remained on the screen while numbers rolled at the bottom. He guessed he was seeing frequencies in megahertz, but he didn't really know. And then, suddenly, the screen went blank, except for a single flashing word in the upper left corner. Log in. He paused, frowning. That was odd. Apparently, he was required to log into the trailer's computer system. That meant he would need a password. He tried Thorn. Nothing happened. He waited a moment, then tried Thorne's initials, J.T. Nothing. Levine. Nothing. Thorne Field Systems. Nothing. TFS. Nothing. Field. Nothing. User. Nothing. Well, he thought, at least the system hadn't dumped him out. Most networks logged you off after three wrong tries. But apparently Thorne hadn't designed any security features into this one. Arby would never have made it this way. The system was too patient and helpful. He tried help. The cursor moved to another line. There was a pause. The drive's word. Action, he said, rubbing his hands. Laboratory. As Thorne's eyes adjusted to the low light, he saw they were standing inside an enormous space consisting of row after row of rectangular stainless steel boxes, each fitted with a tangled maze of plastic tubing. Everything was dusty. Many of the boxes were knocked over. The first rows, Malcolm said, are Nishihara gene sequencers, and beyond are the automatic DNA synthesizers. It's a factory, Eddie said. It's like agribusiness or something. Yes, it is. At the corner of the room was a printer with some loose sheets of yellowing paper lying beside it. 
Malcolm picked up one and glanced at it. It's a reference to a computer database, Malcolm said, for some dinosaur blood factor, something to do with red cells. And is that the sequence? No, Malcolm said. He started shuffling through the papers. No, the sequence should be a series of nucleotides. Here. He picked up another sheet of paper. Does this have something to do with why the animals survived? Thorn said. I'm not sure, Malcolm said. Was this sheet related to the final days of the manufacturing facility, or was it just something that a worker printed out years ago and somehow left behind? He looked around by the printer and found a shelved stack of sheets. Pulling them out, he discovered that they were memos. They were on faded blue paper, and they were all brief. From C.C. slash D. dash P. Jenkins to H. Wu. Excess dopamine in alpha-5 means D1 receptor still not functioning with desired avidity. To minimize aggressive behavior in finished orgs, must try alternate genetic backgrounds. We need to start this today. And again, from CC slash D to H Wu slash SUP. Isolated glycogen synthase kinase 3 from Xenopus may work better than mammalian GSK-3 alpha-beta currently in use. Anticipate more robust establishment of dorsoventral polarity and less early embryo wastage. Agree? Malcolm looked at the next one. From Bacchus to H. Wu. Short protein fragments may be acting as prions. Sourcing doubtful, but suggest halt all exogenous protein for carnivorous orgs until origin is cleared up. Disease cannot continue! Exclamation mark. Thorne looked over his shoulder. Seems like they had problems, he said. Undoubtedly they did, Malcolm said. It would be impossible not to have them. But the question is... He drifted off, staring at the next memo, which was longer. InGen Production Update 101088 from Laurie Russo to all personnel subject low production yields. Recent episodes of wastage of successful live births in the period 24 to 72 hours post-hatching have been traced to contamination from Escherichia coli bacteria. These have cut production yields by 60% and arise from inadequate sterile precautions by floor personnel, principally during process H, egg maintenance phase, hormone enhancement 2G slash H. Comera swing arms have been replaced and resleeved on robots 5A and 7D, but needle replacement must still be done daily in accordance with sterile conditions. General Manual, Guideline 5-9. During the next production cycle, 1012 to 1026, we will sacrifice every tenth egg at H step to test for contamination. Begin set-asides at once. Report all errors. Stop the line whenever necessary until this is cleared up. They had problems with infection and contamination of the production line, Malcolm said. And maybe other sources of contamination as well. Look at this. He handed Thorn the next memo. InGen Production Update 121888 from H. Wu to all personnel. Subject, DX, Tag and Release. Live births will be fitted with the new Grumbach field tags at the earliest viable interval. Formula or other feeding within the laboratory confines will no longer be done. The release program is now fully operational and tracking networks are activated to monitor. Thorne said, Does this mean what I think it means? Yes, 
Malcolm said. They were having trouble keeping the newborn animals alive, so they tagged them and released them. And kept track of them on some kind of network? Yes, I think so. They set dinosaurs loose on this island? Eddie said. They must have been crazy. Desperate is more like it, Malcolm said. Just imagine, here's this huge, expensive, high-tech process. And in the end, the animals are getting sick and dying. Hammond must have been furious, so they decided to get the animals out of the laboratory and into the wild. But why didn't they find the cause of the sickness? Why didn't they... Commercial process, Malcolm said. It's all about results. And I'm sure they thought they were keeping track of the animals. They could get them back any time they wanted. And don't forget, it must have worked. They must have put the animals into the field, then collected them after a while, when they were older, and shipped them to Hammond's Zoo. But not all of them. We don't know everything yet, Malcolm said. We don't know what happened here. They went through the next doorway and found themselves in a small, bare room with a central bench and lockers on the walls. Signs said, Observe Sterile Precautions and Maintain SK-4 Standards. At the end of the room was a cabinet with stacks of yellowing gowns and caps. Eddie said, It's a changing room. Looks like it, Malcolm said. He opened a locker. It was empty except for a pair of men's shoes. He opened several other lockers. They were all empty. Inside one, a sheet of paper was taped. Safety is everybody's business. Report genetic anomalies. Dispose of bio-waste properly. Halt the spread of DX now. What's DX? Eddie said. I think, Malcolm said, it's the name for this mysterious disease. At the far end of the changing room were two doors. The right-hand door was pneumatic, operated by a rubber foot panel set in the floor, but that door was locked, so they went through the left door, which opened freely. They found themselves in a long corridor with floor-to-ceiling glass panels along the right wall. The glass was scratched and dirty, but they peered through it into the room beyond, which was unlike anything Thorne had ever seen. The space was vast, the size of a football field. Conveyor belts crisscrossed the room at two levels, one very high, the other at waist level. At various stations around the room, clusters of large machinery with intricate tubing and swing arms stood beside the belts. Thorne shone his light on the conveyor belts. An assembly line, he said. But it looks untouched, like it's still ready to go, Malcolm said. There are a couple of plants growing through the floor over there, but overall remarkably clean. Too clean, Eddie said. Thorne shrugged. If it's a clean room environment, then it's probably air sealed, he said. I guess it just stayed the way it was years ago. Eddie shook his head. For years? Doc, I don't think so. Then what do you think explains it? Malcolm frowned, peering through the glass. How was it possible for a room this size to remain clean after so many years? It didn't make any... Hey, Eddie said. Malcolm saw it too. It was in the far corner of the room, a small blue box halfway up the wall, cables running into it. It was obviously some kind of electrical junction box. Mounted on the box was a tiny red light. It was glowing. This place has power! Thorne moved close to the glass, looking through with them. That's impossible. It must be some kind of stored charge or a battery. After five years, no battery can last that long, Eddie said. I'm telling you, Doc, this place has power. Arby stared at the monitor as white lettering slowly printed across the screen. 
Are you first-time user of the network? He typed yes. There was another pause. He waited. More letters slowly appeared. Your full name. He typed in his name. Do you want a password issued to you? You're kidding, he thought. This was going to be a snap. It was almost disappointing. He really thought Dr. Thorne would have been more clever. He typed yes. After a moment, your new password is vig forward slash ampersand asterisk 849 forward slash. Please make a note of it. Sure thing, Arby thought. You bet I will. There was no paper on the desk in front of him. He patted his pockets, found a scrap of paper, and wrote it down. Please re-enter your password now. He typed in the series of characters and numbers. There was another pause, and then more printing appeared across the screen. The speed of the printing was oddly slow and halting at times. After all this time, maybe the system wasn't working very... Thank you. Password confirmed. The screen flashed and suddenly turned dark blue. There was an electronic chime, and then... Arby's jaw dropped open as he stared at the screen, which read, International Genetic Technologies, Site B, Local Node Network Services. It didn't make any sense. How could there be a Site B network? InGen had closed Site B years ago. Arby had already read the documents. And InGen was out of business, long since bankrupt. What network, he thought. And how had he managed to get on it? The trailer wasn't connected to anything. There were no cables or anything, so it must be a radio network already on the island. Somehow, he'd managed to log on to it. But how could it exist? A radio network needed power, and there was no power here. Arby waited. Nothing happened. The words just sat there on the screen. He waited for a menu to come up, but one never did. Arby began to think that perhaps the system was defunct or hung up. Maybe it just let you log on and then nothing happened after that. Or maybe he thought he was supposed to do something. He did the simplest thing, which was to press return. He saw remote network services available. Current work files, research, production, field rec, maintenance, administration. Last modified, 10289, 10589, 10989, 111289, 111189. Stored data files. Video network. So it really was an old system. Files hadn't been modified for years. Wondering if it still worked, he clicked on video network. And to his amazement, he saw the screen begin to fill with tiny video images. There were 15 in all, crowding the screen, showing views of various parts of the island. Most of the cameras seemed to be mounted high up in trees or something, and they showed... He stared. They showed dinosaurs. He squinted. It wasn't possible. These were movies or something, he was seeing, because in one corner he saw a herd of triceratops. In an adjacent square, some green lizard-looking things in high grass with just their heads sticking up. In another, a single stegosaurus ambling along. They must be movies, he thought. The dinosaur channel. But then, in another image, Arby saw the two connected trailers standing in the clearing. He could see the black photovoltaic panels glistening on the roof. He almost imagined he could see himself through the window of the trailer. Oh, my God, he thought. And in another image, he saw Thorne and Malcolm and Eddie get quickly into the green explorer and drive around the back of the laboratory, and he realized, with a shock, the pictures were all real. power. They drove the Explorer to the back of the main building, heading for the power station. On the way, they passed a little village to their right. Thorne saw six plantation-style cottages, 
and a larger building marked Manager's Residence. It was clear that the cottages had once been nicely landscaped, but they were now overgrown, partially retaken by the jungle. In the center of the complex, they saw a tennis court, a drained swimming pool, a small gas pump in front of what looked like a little general store. Thorne said, I wonder how many people they had here. Eddie said, How do you know they're all gone? What do you mean? Doc, they have power. After all these years, there has to be an explanation for it. Eddie steered the car around the back of the loading bays and drove toward the power station directly ahead. The power station was a windowless, featureless concrete blockhouse marked only by a corrugated steel rim for ventilation around the top. The steel vents were long since rusted a uniform brown with flecks of yellow. Eddie drove the car around the block looking for a door. He found it at the back. It was a heavy steel door with a peeling, painted sign that said, Caution, high voltage, do not enter. Eddie jumped out of the car and the others followed. Thorne sniffed the air. Sulfur, he said. Very strong, Malcolm said, nodding. Eddie tugged at the door. Guys, I got a feeling. The door opened suddenly with a clang, banging against the concrete wall. Eddie peered into darkness inside. Thorne saw a dense maze of pipes, a trickle of steam coming out of the floor. The room was extremely hot. There was a loud, constant whirring sound. Eddie said, I'll be damned. He walked forward, looking at the gauges, many of which were unreadable, the glass thickly coated with yellow. The joints of the pipes were also rimmed with yellow crust. Eddie wiped away some of the crust with his finger. Amazing, he said. Sulfur? Yes, yeah, sulfur, amazing. He turned toward the source of the sound, saw a large circular vent, a turbine inside. The turbine blades, spinning rapidly, were dull yellow. And that's sulfur, too, Thorne said. No, Eddie said. That must be gold. Those turbine blades are gold alloy. Gold? Yeah, it would have to be very inert. He turned to Thorne. You realize what all this is? It's incredible. So compact and efficient, nobody has figured out how to do this. The technology is... You're saying it's geothermal? Malcolm said. That's right, Eddie said. They've tapped a heat source here, probably gas or steam, which is piped up through the floor over there. Then the heat is used to boil water in a closed cycle, that's the network of pipes up there, and turn the turbine there, which makes electric power. Whatever the heat source, geothermal's almost always corrosive as hell. Most places, maintenance is brutal, but this plant still works amazing. Along one wall was a main panel, which distributed power to the entire laboratory complex. The panel was flecked with mold and dented in several spots. Doesn't look like anybody's been in here in years, he said, and a lot of the power grid is dead, but the plant itself is still going. Incredible. Thorne coughed in the sulfurous air and walked back into the sunlight. He looked up at the rear of the laboratory. One of the loading bays seemed in good shape, but the other had collapsed. The glass at the rear of the building was shattered. Malcolm came to stand beside him. I wonder if an animal hit the building. You think an animal could do that much damage? Malcolm nodded. Some of these dinosaurs weigh 40, 50 tons. A single animal has the mass of a whole herd of elephants. That could easily be damaged from an animal, yes. You notice that path running there? That's a game trail going past the loading bays and down the hill. It could have been animals, yes. Thorne said, Didn't they think of that when they released the animals in the first place? Oh, I'm sure they just planned to release them for a few weeks or months, then round them up when they were still juvenile. I doubt they ever thought they... They were interrupted by a crackling electrical hiss like static. It was coming from inside the Explorer. Behind them, Eddie hurried toward the car with a worried look. I know it, Eddie said. Our communications module is frying. I knew we should have put in the other one. He opened the door to the Explorer and climbed in the passenger side, picked up the handset, pressed the automatic tuner. 
Through the windshield, he saw Thorne and Malcolm coming back toward the car. And then the transmission locked. Into the car, said a scratchy voice. Who is this? Dr. Thorne, Dr. Malcolm, get in the car. As Thorne arrived, Eddie said, Doc, it's that damn kid. What? Thorne said. It's Arby. Over the radio, Arby was saying, Get in the car, I can see it coming. What's he talking about? Thorne said, frowning. He's not here, is he? Is he on this island? The radio crackled. Yes, I'm here, Dr. Thorne. But how the hell did he? Dr. Thorne, get in the car. Thorne turned purple with anger. He bunched his fists. How did that little son of a bitch manage to do this? He grabbed the handset from Eddie. Arby, goddammit, it's coming, Eddie said. What's he talking about? He sounds completely hysterical. I can see it on the television, Dr. Thorne. Malcolm looked around at the jungle. Maybe we should get in the car, he said quietly. What does he mean, television, Thorne said. He was furious. Eddie said, I don't know, Doc, but if he's got a feed in the trailer, we can see it too. He flicked on the dashboard monitor. He watched as the screen glowed to life. That damn kid, Thorne said. I'm going to wring his neck. I thought you liked that kid, Malcolm said. I do, but chaos at work, Malcolm said, shaking his head. Eddie was looking at the monitor. Oh, shit, he said. On the tiny dashboard monitor, they had a view looking straight down at the powerful body of a Tyrannosaurus rex as it moved up the game trail toward them. Its skin was a mottled reddish-brown, the color of dried blood. In dappled sunlight, they could clearly see the powerful muscles of its haunches. The animal moved quickly, without any sign of fear or hesitation. Staring, Thorne said, Everybody in the car. The men climbed hurriedly in. On the monitor, the Tyrannosaur moved out of view of the camera. But sitting in the Explorer, they could hear it coming. The earth was shaking beneath them, swaying the car slightly. Thorne said, Ian, what do you think we should do? Malcolm didn't answer. He was frozen, staring forward, eyes blank. Ian, Thorne said. The radio clicked. Arby said, Dr. Thorne, I've lost him on the monitor. Can you see him yet? Jesus, Eddie said. With astonishing speed, the Tyrannosaurus Rex burst into view, emerging from the foliage to the right of the explorer. The animal was immense, the size of a two-story building, its head rising high above them out of sight. Yet for such a large creature, it moved with incredible speed and agility. Thorne stared in stunned silence, waiting to see what would happen. He felt the car vibrate with each thundering footstep. Eddie moaned softly. But the Tyrannosaur ignored them. Continuing at the same rapid pace, it moved swiftly past the front of the Explorer. They hardly had a chance to see it before its big head and body disappeared into the foliage to the left. Now they saw only the thick, counterbalancing tail, some seven feet in the air, swinging back and forth with each footstep as the animal moved on. So fast, Thorne thought, fast. The giant animal had emerged, blocked their vision, and then was gone again. He was not accustomed to seeing something that big move so fast. Now there was only the tip of the tail swinging back and forth as the animal hurried away. Then the tail banged against the front of the explorer with a loud, metallic clang, and the tyrannosaur stopped. They heard a low, uncertain growl from the jungle. The tail swung back and forth in the air again, more tentatively. Soon enough, the tail brushed lightly against the radiator a second time. Now they saw the foliage to the left rustling and bending, and the tail was gone. Because the Tyrannosaur, Thorne realized, was coming back. Re-emerging from the jungle, it moved toward the car until it was standing directly in front of them. It growled again, a deep, rumbling sound, and turned its head slightly from side to side to look at this strange new object. Then it bent over 
and Thorn could see that the Tyrannosaur had something in its mouth. He saw the legs of a creature dangling on both sides of the jaws. Flies buzzed in a thick cloud around the Tyrannosaur's head. Eddie moaned. Oh, fuck. Quiet, Thorn whispered. The Tyrannosaurus snorted and looked at the car. It bent lower and sniffed repeatedly, moving its head slightly to the left and right with each inhalation. Thorn realized it was smelling the radiator. It moved laterally and sniffed the tires. Then it lifted its huge head slowly until its eyes rose above the surface of the hood. It stared at them through the windshield. Its eyes blinked. The gaze was cold and reptilian. Thorn had the distinct impression that the Tyrannosaur was looking at them. Its eyes shifted from one person to the next. With its blunt nose, it pushed at the side of the car, rocking it slightly as if testing its weight, measuring it as an opponent. Thorn gripped the steering wheel tightly and held his breath. And then, abruptly, the Tyrannosaur stepped away and walked to the front of the car. It turned its back on them, lifting its big tail high. The Tyrannosaur backed up toward them. They heard the tail scraping across the roof of the car. The rear haunches came closer. And then the Tyrannosaur sat down on the hood, tilting the vehicle, pushing the bumper into the ground with its enormous weight. At first it did not move, but simply sat there. Then, after a moment, it began to wriggle its hips back and forth in a quick motion, making the metal squeak. What the hell? Eddie said. The Tyrannosaur stood again. The car sprang back up, and Thorn saw thick white paste smeared across the hood. The Tyrannosaur immediately moved away, heading down the game trail, disappearing into the jungle. Behind them, they saw it emerge into the open again, stalk across the open compound. It lumbered behind the convenience store, passed between two of the cottages, and then disappeared from sight again. Thorn glanced at Eddie, who jerked his head toward Malcolm. Malcolm had not turned to watch the departing Tyrannosaur. He was still staring forward, his body tense. Ian, Thorne said. He touched him on the shoulder. Malcolm said, Is he gone? Yes, he's gone. Ian Malcolm's body relaxed, his shoulders dropping. He exhaled slowly. His head sagged to his chest. He took a deep breath and raised his head again. You've got to admit, he said, you don't see that every day. Are you okay? Thorne said. Yeah, sure, I'm fine. He put his hand on his chest, feeling his heart. Of course I'm fine. After all, that was just a small one. Small? Eddie said. You call that thing small? Yes, for a tyrannosaur. Females are quite a bit larger. There's sexual dimorphism in tyrannosaurs. The females are bigger than the males, and it's generally thought they did most of the hunting but we may find that out for ourselves. Wait a minute, Eddie said. What makes you so sure he was a male? Malcolm pointed to the hood of the car, where the white paste now gave off a pungent odor. He scent-marked territory. So maybe females can also mark... Very likely they can, Malcolm said, but anal scent glands are found only among males. And you saw how he did it. Eddie stared unhappily at the hood. I hope we can get that stuff off, he said. I brought some solvents, but I wasn't expecting, you know, dino musk. The radio clicked. Dr. Thorne, Arby said. Dr. Thorne, is everything all right? Yes, Arby, thanks to you, he said. Then why are you waiting? Dr. Thorne, didn't you see Dr. Levine? Not yet, no. Thorne reached for his sensor unit, but it had fallen to the floor. He bent over and picked it up. Levine's coordinates had changed. 
He's moving. I know he's moving, Dr. Thorne. Yes, R.B., Thorne said, and then he said, Wait a minute. How do you know he's moving? Because I can see him, R.B. said. He's riding a bicycle. Kelly came into the front of the trailer, yawning and pushing her hair back from her face. Who are you talking to, Arb? She stared at the monitor and said, Hey, pretty neat. I got onto the Site B network, he said. What network? It's a radio LAN, Kel. For some reason, it's still up. Is that right? But how did... Kids, Thorne said over the radio. If you don't mind, we're looking for Levine. Arby picked up the handset. He's riding a bicycle down a path in the jungle. It's pretty steep and narrow. I think he's following the same path as a tyrannosaur, Kelly said. As the what? Thorne put the car in gear, driving away from the power station toward the worker compound. He went past the gas station and then between the cottages. He followed the same path the tyrannosaur had taken. The game trail was fairly wide, easy to follow. We shouldn't have those kids here, Malcolm said gloomily. It's not safe. Not much we can do about it now, Thorne said. He clicked the radio. Arby, do you see Levine now? The car bounced through what had once been a flower bed and around the back of the manager's residence. It was a large two-story building built in a tropical colonial style with hardwood balconies all around the upper floor. Like the other houses, it was overgrown. The radio clicked. Yes, Dr. Thorne, I see him. Where is he? He's following the Tyrannosaur on his bicycle. Following the Tyrannosaur, Malcolm sighed. I should never have gotten involved with him. We all agree on that, Thorne said. He accelerated, driving past a section of broken stone wall which seemed to mark the outer perimeter of the compound. The car plunged on into jungle, following the game trail. Over the radio, Arby said, Do you see him yet? Not yet. The trail became progressively narrower, twisting as it ran down the hillside. They came around a curve and suddenly saw a fallen tree blocking the path. The tree had been denuded in the center, its branches stripped and broken, presumably because large animals had repeatedly stepped over it. Thorne braked to a stop in front of the tree. He got out and walked around to the back of the explorer. Doc, Eddie said, let me do it. No, Thorne said. If anything happens, you're the only one who can repair the equipment. You're more important, especially now that we have the kids. Standing behind the car, Thorne lifted the motorcycle off the carrier hooks. He swung it down, checked the battery charge, and rolled it to the front of the car. He said to Malcolm, Give me that rifle, and slung the rifle around his shoulder. Thorne took a headset from the dashboard and put it over his head. He clipped the battery pack to his belt, placed the microphone alongside his cheek. You two go back to the trailer, Thorne said. Take care of the kids. But Doc, Eddie began, just do it, Thorne said, and lifted the motorcycle over the fallen tree. He set it down on the other side and climbed over himself. Then he saw the same pungent, pale secretions on the trunk. It had smeared on his hands. He glanced back at Malcolm questioningly. Marking territory... Malcolm said. Great, Thorne said. Just great. He wiped his hands on his trousers. Then he got on the motorcycle and drove off. Foliage slapped at Thorne's shoulders and legs as he drove down the game trail, following the tyrannosaur. The animal was somewhere up ahead, but he couldn't see it. He was driving fast. The radio headset crackled. Arby said, Dr. Thorne, I can see you now. Okay, Thorne said. It crackled again. But I can't see Dr. Levine anymore, Arby said. He sounded worried. The electric motorcycle made hardly any noise, particularly going downhill. Up ahead, the game trail divided in two. Thorne stopped, leaned over the bike, looking at the muddy path. He saw the footprints of the tyrannosaur going off to the left, and he saw the thin line of the bicycle tires, also going off to the left. He took the left fork, but now... He drove more slowly. Ten yards ahead, Thorne passed the partially eaten leg of a creature which lay at the side of the path. The leg was old. It was crawling with white maggots and flies. In the morning heat, the sharp smell was nauseating. 
He continued, but soon saw the skull of a large animal, some of the flesh and green skin still adhering to the bone. It, too, was covered with flies. Speaking into the microphone, he said, I'm passing some partial carcasses. The radio crackled. Now he heard Malcolm say, I was afraid of that. Afraid of what? There may be a nest, Malcolm said. Did you notice the carcass that the Tyrannosaur had in its jaws? It was scavenged, but he hadn't eaten it. There's a good chance he was taking the food home to a nest. A Tyrannosaur nest, Thorn said. I'd be cautious, Malcolm said. Thorn slipped the bike into neutral and rolled the rest of the way down the hill. When the ground leveled out, he climbed off the motorcycle. He could feel the earth vibrate beneath his feet, and from the bushes ahead he heard a deep rumbling sound like the purr of a large jungle cat. Thorn looked around. He didn't see any sign of Levine's bicycle. Thorn unshouldered the rifle and gripped it in sweating hands. He heard the purring growl again, rising and falling. There was something odd about the sound. It took Thorne a moment to realize what it was. It came from more than one source, more than one big animal purring beyond the foliage directly ahead. Thorne bent over, picked up a handful of grass, and released it in the air. The grass blew back toward his legs. He was downwind. He slipped forward through the foliage. The ferns around him were huge and dense, but up ahead he could see sunlight shining through from a clearing beyond. The sound of purring was very loud now. There was another sound as well, an odd squeaking sound. It was high-pitched and at first sounded almost mechanical, like a squeaking wheel. Thorne hesitated. Then, very slowly, he lowered a frond. And he stared. Nest In the mid-morning light, two enormous tyrannosaurs, each twenty feet high, loomed above him. Their reddish skin had a leathery appearance. Their huge heads were fierce-looking, with heavy jaws and large, sharp teeth. But somehow, here the animals conveyed no sense of menace to Thorn. They moved slowly, almost gently, bending repeatedly over a large, circular rampart of dried mud nearly four feet high. The two adults held bits of red flesh in their jaws, as they ducked their heads below the mud wall. The movement was greeted by a frantic, high-pitched squeaking sound, which stopped almost immediately. Then, when the adults lifted their heads again, the flesh was gone. There was no question. This was the nest. And Malcolm had been right. One Tyrannosaur was noticeably larger than the other. In a few moments, the squeaking resumed. It sounded to Thorn like baby birds. The adults continued to duck their heads, feeding the unseen babies. A bit of torn flesh landed on the top of the mud mound. As he watched, Thorn saw an infant tyrannosaur rise into view above the rampart and start to scramble over the side. The infant was about the size of a turkey, with a large head and very large eyes. Its body was covered with a fluffy red down which gave it a scraggly appearance. A ring of pale white down circled its neck. The infant squeaked repeatedly and it crawled awkwardly toward the meat using its weak forearms. But when it finally reached the carrion, it jabbed, biting the flesh decisively with tiny sharp teeth. It was busily eating the food when it screeched in alarm and started to slide down the outer wall of dried mud. Immediately, the mother tyrannosaur dropped her head and intercepted the baby's fall, then gently nudged the animal back inside the nest. Thorne was impressed by the delicacy of her movements, the attentive way she cared for her young. 
The father, meanwhile, continued to tear small pieces of meat. Both animals kept up a continuous purring growl as if to reassure the infants. As Thorn watched, he shifted his position. His foot stepped on a branch. There was a sharp crack. Immediately, both adults jerked their heads up. Thorn froze. He held his breath. The Tyrannosaurus scanned the area around the nest, looking intently in every direction. Their bodies were tense, their heads alert. Their eyes flicked back and forth, accompanied by little head jerks. After a moment, they seemed to relax again. They bobbed their heads up and down and rubbed their snouts against each other. It seemed to be some kind of ritual movement, almost a dance. Only then did they resume feeding the infants. When they had calmed down, Thorn slipped away, moving quietly back to the motorcycle. Arby whispered over the headset, Dr. Thorn, I can't see you. Thorn didn't answer. He tapped the microphone with his finger to signal that he had heard. Arby whispered, I think I know where Dr. Levine is. He's off to your left. Thorn tapped the mic again and turned. To his left, among ferns, he saw a rusted bicycle. It said, Property InGen Corporation. It was leaning against a tree. Not bad, Arby thought, sitting in the trailer and watching the remote videos as he clicked on them. He now had the monitor divided into quarters. It was a good compromise between lots of views and images large enough to see. One of the views looked down from above on the two tyrannosaurs in the secluded clearing. It was mid-morning. The sun shone brightly on the muddy, trampled grass of the clearing. In the center, he saw a round, steep-walled nest of mud. Inside the nest were four mottled white eggs about the size of footballs. There were also some broken egg fragments and two baby tyrannosaurs looking exactly like featherless, squeaking birds. They sat in the nest with their heads turned up like baby birds, mouths gaping wide, waiting to be fed. Kelly watched the screen and said, Look how cute they are. And then she added, We should be out there. Arby didn't answer her. He was not at all sure he wanted to be any closer. The adults were being very cool about it, but Arby found the idea of these dinosaurs very unnerving in some deep way that he couldn't analyze. Arby had always found it reassuring to organize, to create order in his life. Even arranging the images neatly on the computer monitor was calming to him. But this island was a place where everything was unknown and unexpected, where you didn't know what would happen. He found that troubling. On the other hand, Kelly was excited. She kept making comments about the tyrannosaurs, how big they were, the size of their teeth. She seemed entirely enthusiastic, without any fear at all. Arby felt annoyed with her. Anyway, she said, what makes you think you know where Dr. Levine is? Arby pointed to the image of the nest on the monitor. Watch. I see it. No. Watch, Kel. As they stared at the screen, the image moved slightly. It panned to the left, then centered again. See that? Arby said. So what? Maybe the wind is blowing the camera or something. Arby shook his head. No, Kel, he's up in the tree. Levine's moving the camera. Oh, a pause. She watched again. You might be right. Arby grinned. That was about all he could expect to get from Kelly. Yeah, I think so. But what's Dr. Levine doing in the tree? Maybe he's adjusting the camera. They listened to Thorne's breathing over the radio. Kelly stared at the four video images, each showing a different view of the island. She sighed. I can't wait to get out there, she said. Yeah, me too, Arby said, but he didn't mean it. He glanced out the window of the trailer and saw the explorer coming back with Eddie and Malcolm. Secretly, he was glad to see them return. Thorne stood at the base of the tree looking up. 
He couldn't see Levine through the leaves, but he knew he must be somewhere up above because he was making what seemed to Thorne like a lot of noise. Thorne glanced nervously back at the clearing, screened by intervening foliage. He could still hear the purring. It remained steady, uninterrupted. Thorne waited. What the hell was Levine doing up in a tree anyway? He heard rustling in the branches above, and then silence, a grunt, then more rustling. And then Levine said aloud, Oh, shit, then a loud crashing sound, the crack of branches and a howl of pain, and then Levine crashed down on the ground in front of Thorn, landing hard on his back. He rolled over, clutching his shoulder. Damn, he said. Levine wore muddy khakis that were torn in several places. Behind a three-day growth of beard, his face was haggard and spattered with mud. He looked up as Thorne moved toward him and grinned. You're the last person I expected to see, Doc, Levine said. But your timing is flawless. Thorne extended his hand, and Levine started to reach for it when, from the clearing behind them, the tyrannosaurs gave a deafening roar. Oh, no, Kelly said. On the monitor, the tyrannosaurs were agitated, moving swiftly in circles, raising their heads and bellowing. Dr. Thorne, what's happening? Arby said. They heard Levine's voice, tinny and scratchy on the radio, but they couldn't make out the words. Eddie and Malcolm came into the trailer. Malcolm took one look at the monitor and said, Tell them to get out of there right now. On the monitor, the two tyrannosaurs had turned their backs to each other, so they were facing outward in a posture of defense. The babies were protected in the center. The adults swung their heavy tails back and forth over the nest above the babies' heads, but the tension was palpable. And then one of the adults bellowed and charged out of the clearing. Dr. Thorne, Dr. Levine, get out of there! Thorne swung his leg over the bike and gripped the rubber handles. Levine jumped on behind, clutched him around the waist. Thorne heard a chilling roar and looked back to see one of the tyrannosaurs crash through the foliage and charge them. The animal was running at full speed, head low, jaws open, in an unmistakable posture of attack. Thorne twisted the throttle. The electric motor whirred, the back wheels spun in the mud, not moving. Go! Levine shouted, go! The tyrannosaur rushed toward them, roaring. Thorne could feel the ground shake. The roar was so loud it hurt his ears. The tyrannosaur was nearly on them, the big head lunging forward, jaws wide open. Thorne kicked back with his heels, pushing the bike forward. Suddenly the rear wheel caught, throwing up a plume of mud, and the bike roared up the muddy track. He accelerated fast. The motorcycle fished and swerved treacherously on the trail. Behind him, Levine was shouting something, but Thorne didn't listen. His heart was pounding. The bike jumped across a rut in the path, and they almost lost their balance, then regained it, accelerating again. Thorne did not dare look back. He could smell the odor of rotten flesh, could hear the rasping breath of the giant animal in pursuit. Doc, take it easy, Levine shouted. Thorne ignored him. The bike roared up the hill. The foliage slapped at them. Mud spit up on their faces and chests. He was pulled over into a rut, then brought the bike back to the center of the trail. He heard another roar and imagined it was a bit fainter, but, Doc, Levine shouted, leaning close to his ear, what are you trying to do, kill us? Doc, we're alone. Thorne came to a flat part of the path and risked a glance back over his shoulder. Levine was right. They were alone. He saw no sign of the pursuing Tyrannosaur, though he still heard it roaring somewhere in the distance. He slowed the bike. Take it easy, Levine said, shaking his head. His face was ashen, frightened. You're a terrible driver, do you know that? You ought to take some lessons. You almost got us killed there. He was attacking us, Thorne said angrily. He was familiar with Levine's critical manner, but right now... That's absurd, Levine said. He wasn't attacking at all. It sure as hell looked like it, Thorne said. No, 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 Levine said. He wasn't attacking us. The Rex was defending his nest. There's a big difference. I didn't see any difference, Thorne said. He pulled the bike to a stop and glared at Levine. In point of fact, Levine said, if the Rex had decided to chase you, we'd be dead right now. 
but he stopped almost immediately. He did, Thorne said. There's no question about it, Levine said in his pedantic manner. The Rex only intended to scare us off and defend his territory. He'd never leave the nest unguarded unless we took something or disrupted the nest. I'm sure he's back there with his mate right now, hovering over the eggs, not going anywhere. Then I guess we're lucky he's a good parent, Thorne said, gunning the motor. Of course he's a good parent, Levine continued. Any fool could tell that. Didn't you see how thin he was? He's been neglecting his own nourishment to feed his offspring. Probably been doing it for weeks. A Tyrannosaurus rex is a complex animal with complex hunting behavior. And he has complex child-rearing behavior as well. I wouldn't be surprised if adult Tyrannosaurs have an extended parenting role that lasts for months. He may teach his offspring to hunt, for example. Start by bringing in small, wounded animals and letting the youngsters finish them off. That kind of thing. It'll be interesting to find out exactly what he does. Why are we waiting here? Through Thorne's earpiece, the radio crackled. Malcolm said, It would never occur to him to thank you for saving his life. Thorne grunted. Evidently not, he said. Levine said, Who are you talking to? Is it Malcolm? Is he here? Yes, Thorne said. He's agreeing with me, isn't he? Levine said. Not exactly, Thorne said, shaking his head. Look, Doc, Levine said, I'm sorry if you got upset, but there was no reason for it. The truth is, we were never in danger, except from your bad driving. Fine, that's fine. Thorne's heart was still pounding in his chest. He took a deep breath, swung the bike to the left, and headed down a wider path back toward their camp. Sitting behind him, Levine said, I'm very glad to see you, Doc. I really am. Thorne didn't answer. He followed the path downward through foliage. They descended to the valley, picking up speed. Soon they saw the trailers in the clearing below. Levine said, Good, you brought everything. And the equipment's working? Everything in good condition? It all seems to be fine. Perfect, Levine said. Then this is just perfect. Maybe not, Thorne said. Through the back window of the trailer, Kelly and Arby were waving cheerfully through the glass. You're kidding, Levine said. Fourth Configuration Approaching the chaotic edge, elements show internal conflict, an unstable and potentially lethal region. Ian Malcolm Levine they came running across the clearing, shouting, Dr. Levine, Dr. Levine, you're safe. They hugged Levine, who smiled despite himself. He turned to Thorne. Doc, Levine said, this was very unwise. Why don't you explain that to them? Thorne said, they're your students. Kelly said, don't be mad, Dr. Levine. It was our decision. Arby explained to Levine, we came on our own. On your own? Levine said. We thought you'd need help, Arby said, and you did. He turned to Thorne. Thorne nodded. Yes, they've helped us. And we promise we won't get in the way, Kelly said. You go ahead and do whatever you have to do, and we will just... The kids were worried about you, Malcolm said, coming up to Levine, because they thought you were in trouble. Anyway, what's the big rush, Eddie said. I mean, you build all these vehicles, and then you leave without them. I had no choice. Levine said. The government has an outbreak of some new encephalitis on its hands. They've decided it's related to the occasional dinosaur carcass that washes up there. Of course, the whole idea is idiotic, but that won't stop them from destroying every animal on this island the minute they find out about it. I had to get here first. Time is short. So you came here alone, Malcolm said. Nonsense, Ian. Stop pouting. I was going to call you as soon as I verified this was the island. And I didn't come here alone. I had a guide named Diego, a local man who swore he had been on this island as a kid years before. And he seemed entirely knowledgeable. He led me up the cliff without any problem. And everything was going just fine until we were attacked at the stream. And Diego... Attacked? Malcolm said. By what? I didn't really see what it was, Levine said. 
It happened extremely fast. The animal knocked me down and tore the backpack, and I don't really know what happened after that. Possibly the shape of my pack confused it because I got up and started running again, and it didn't chase me. Malcolm was staring at him. You were damn lucky, Richard. Yes, well, I ran for a long time. When I looked back, I was alone in the jungle and lost. I didn't know what to do, so I climbed a tree. That seemed like a good idea, and then, around nightfall, the velociraptors showed up. Velociraptors? Arby said. Small carnivores, Levine said. Basic theropod body shape, long snout, binocular vision, roughly two meters tall, weighing perhaps 90 kilos. Very fast, intelligent, nasty little dinosaurs, and they travel in packs. And last night, there were eight of them jumping all around my tree, trying to get to me, all night long, jumping and snarling, jumping and snarling. I didn't get any sleep at all. Ah, oh, that's a shame, Eddie said. Look, Levine said crossly. It's not my problem if, Thorne said, you spent the night in the tree? Yes, and in the morning the raptors had gone, so I came down and started looking around. I found the lab, or whatever it is. Clearly they abandoned it in a hurry, leaving some animals behind. I went through the building and discovered that there is still power. Some systems are still going, all these years later. And most important, there is a network of security cameras. That's a very lucky break. So I decided to check on those cameras, and I was hard at work when you people barged in. Wait a minute, Eddie said. We came here to rescue you. I don't know why, Levine said. I certainly never asked you to. Thorne said, it sounded like you did over the phone. That is a misunderstanding, Levine said. I was momentarily upset because I couldn't work the phone. You've made that phone too complicated, Doc. That's the problem. So, shall we get started? Levine paused. He looked at the angry faces all around him. Malcolm turned to Thorne. A great scientist, he said, and a great human being. Look, Levine said, I don't know what your problem is. The expedition was going to come to this island sooner or later. In this instance, sooner is better. Everything has turned out quite well, and frankly, I don't see any reason to discuss it further. This is not the time for petty bickering. We have important things to do, and I think we should get started, because this island is an extraordinary opportunity, and it isn't going to last forever. Dodgson Louis Dodgson sat hunched in a dark corner of the Chespirito Cantina in Puerto Cortes, nursing a beer. Beside him, George Basilton, the Regis Professor of Biology at Stanford, was enthusiastically devouring a plate of huevos rancheros. The egg yolks ran yellow across green salsa. It made Dodgson sick just to look at it. He turned away, but he could still hear Basilton licking his lips noisily. There was no one else in the bar except for some chickens clucking around the floor. Every so often a young boy would come to the door, throw a handful of rocks at the chickens, and run away again, giggling. A scratchy stereo played an old Elvis Presley tape through corroded speakers above the bar. Dodson hummed falling in love with you and tried to control his temper. He had been sitting in this dump for damn near an hour. Basilton finished his eggs and pushed the plate away. He brought out the small notebook he carried everywhere with him. Now, Lo, he said, I've been thinking about how to handle this. Handle what? Dodson said irritably. There's nothing to handle unless we can get to that island. While he spoke, he tapped a small photograph of Richard Levine on the edge of the bar table, turned it over, looked at the image upside down, then right side up. He sighed. He looked at his watch. Lou, Basilton said patiently, getting to the island is not the important part. The important part is how we present our discovery to the world. Dodson paused. Our discovery, he repeated. I like that, George. That's very good, our discovery. Well, that's the truth, isn't it? Basilton said with a bland smile. Ingen is bankrupt, its technology lost to mankind, a tragic, tragic loss, as I have said many times on television, but under the circumstances, anyone who finds it again has made a discovery. I don't know what else he would call it. As Henri Poincaré put it, Okay, Dodson said, so we make a discovery. 
And then what? Hold a press conference? Absolutely not, Basilton said, looking horrified. A press conference would appear extremely crass. It would open us up to all sorts of criticism. No, no. A discovery of this magnitude must be treated with decorum. It must be reported, Lou. Reported? In the literature. Nature, I imagine. Yes. Dodgson squinted. You want to announce this in an academic publication? What better way to make it legitimate, Basilton said. It's entirely proper to present our findings to our scholarly peers. Of course it will start a debate, but what will that debate consist of? An academic squabble, professors sniping at professors, which will fill the science pages of the newspapers for three days until it is pushed aside by the latest news on breast implants. And in those three days, we will have staked our claim. You write it? Yes, Basilton said. And later, I think, an article in American Scholar or perhaps natural history, a human interest piece, what this discovery means for the future, what it tells us about the past, all that. Dodson nodded. He could see that Basilton was correct, and he was reminded once again how much he needed him and how wise he had been to add him to the team. Dodson never thought about public reaction, and Basilton thought about nothing else. Well, that's fine. Dodgson said, but none of it matters unless we get to that island. He glanced at his watch again. He heard a door open behind him, and Dodgson's assistant, Howard King, came in, pulling a heavy-set Costa Rican man with a mustache. The man had a weathered face and a sullen expression. Dodgson turned on his stool. Is this the guy? Yes, Lou. What's his name? Gandoka. Senor Gandoka. Dodson held up the photo of Levine. You know this man? Gandoka hardly glanced at the photo. He nodded. See, si, Senor Levine. That's right. Senor fucking Levine. When was he here? A few days ago. He left with Deguito, my cousin. They are not back yet. And where did they go? Dodson asked. Isla Sorna. Good. Dodson drained his beer, pushed the bottle away. You have a boat? He turned to King. Does he have a boat? King said, He's a fisherman. He has a boat. Gandoka nodded. A fishing boat, see. Good. I want to go to Isla Sorna, too. See, si, senor, but today the weather... I don't care about the weather, Dodson said. The weather will get better. I want to go now. Perhaps later now. Gandoka spread his hands. I am very sorry, senor, Dodgson said. Show him the money, Howard. King opened a briefcase. It was filled with 5,000 cologne notes. Gandoka looked, picked up one of the bills, inspected it. He put it back carefully, shifted on his feet a little. Dodgson said, I want to go now. Si, sí, senor, Gandoka said. We leave when you are ready. That's more like it. Dodgson said. How long to get to the island? Perhaps two hours, senor? Fine, Dodgson said. That'll be fine. 